song. Okay, here we go. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Yes, all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. just say happy happy Mother's Day what's the difference between Superman and mothers Superman is strong confident and is just a superhero now and then moms are strong and confident and moms are superheroes all the time. Let us pray together. Lord, thank you for every woman here today. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your word together. Thank you for the blessing mothers are to you, to us, into your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, that you created each woman in your own image. Bless them and desire that they walk in a deep and personal relationship with you. Lord, we lift up to you every mother's heart in this room today. The mother's heart who have been blessed by you. Where fear has taken root, we ask that you remove it and replace it with your peace. Remind every woman and every mother here today that they are significant to the kingdom of God because they belong to you, daughters of the king. Where there is confusion, deception, discouragement, and loneliness, we ask that you invade every woman's heart with the power of the gospel. So I'm praying, Father, to this simple passage of scripture and these few simple principles that you would what only you can to take this message and divide it up however many thousands of ways you need to and take it straight to the other side of this camera screen, Lord, to the person that is listening, so that they will know beyond the shadow of a doubt on this Mother's Day that they heard the voice of God. Speak, Lord. We are your servants, and we are listening. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let everyone say amen. 
Amen. Our subject today is a mother's commitment to Jesus. A mother's commitment to Jesus. In John chapter 20, verses 30 and verse 31, I am reading from the New American Standard Bible. Listen to this. He says, Many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, but these are written in this book, but these, the ones I have included, they are the ones that I have written because these are the signs that are designed to make you a believer, to make you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life through his name. Did you hear that? John was clear. He says, when he gets to the end of the book, in chapter 20, I am telling you, there are so, so many other things that I could have included. There are so many encounters Jesus had, so many other miracles that I saw, so many other messages I heard him give out of his mouth. So many other conversations I heard him have with other people. John says, I could have included a whole lot of other things. But these are the ones chosen by the Holy Spirit's inspiration. These are the ones chosen for me to include in this gospel because these are the ones that I think are going to point you straight to Jesus. He says these signs are going to make a believer out of you. See, signs are so important nowadays and all of the signs that is in the book of John. The first sign one that John told us about is the most important. And the reason why is because the first sign was the one that was actually marked for us that we are headed in the right direction. The first sign would make us feel assured that we are in the right place and that we should keep on going. Hippomone in the Greek. Keep on going no matter what life throws at you. Be encouraged. That's what I think of when I think about this passage of scripture. And the reason why I think it, of it because the, the book of John is filled with signs. John, the author, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says exquisitely, that the reason why he is writing the way he writes and why he is including the kind of encounters that Jesus had that he decided to include in this text is because he wants us to be clear of the obvious signs that assured us that we are headed in the right directions with our eyes focused on Jesus. The signs are designed to point us to Jesus. The first sign in the text is like the first chapter of a book you might, you might read, uh, like a novel or the first bar of a musical rendition that appears when a guitar player plays. The, the, the designs of the initial inaugural experiences are supposed to whet your appetite to so severely, they're supposed to heighten you such a sense of anticipation that you can't help but lean in and take in everything that comes after it because the beginning has been so phenomenal. John says 
Here's the first sign that I want to include. John chapter 2, verses 1 through verse number 11. John chapter 2, verses 1 through verse number 11. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. We're talking about the miracle at Cana. It reads as follows. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited, verse 2 says, and his disciples came to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. Verse 5, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots standing there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. So Jesus, seeing the containers there, said to the servants, fill up all those containers, those water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And then he said to them, now take some out and take them to the head servant. So they took it to him. Now, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I do know that sometimes between verse 8 and verse number 9, that water became something totally different. Because by the time they made it to the head servant, in verse 9, the head servant tasted the water, which had already become wine. And he did not know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water, they knew. And the head waiter called the groom. And he said to him, Every man serve the good wine first. And men have drunk freely. Then he serves that which is poor. It makes good sense to me. That after everybody had got the good stuff. They are too drunk to know the poor stuff is now flowing. <laughs> you see what I'm talking about? But, but you, the head waiter, says to the bridegroom, you save the best stuff for now. Verse 11. This was the beginning of Jesus' signs. He did it in Cana of Galilee. He manifested his glory through this first sign, and look at the last line of verse number 11. And his disciples believed in him. His disciples? His disciples believe in him? For me, that's completely curious to hear something like that. Because it implies that it is possible to be a disciple who does not yet believe. It means that you can have a relationship with Jesus. That you could walk, you can walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus and learn from Jesus. That you can see Jesus do miracles in the lives of other people. You can even experience them yourselves. It means that you can hear Jesus speaking. The Holy Spirit speaking to us, you can be in relationship with Jesus and yet still not be a real true believer. Meaning, someone who lives a life in, a, in complete dependence on him. Someone who, when crisis hits, like the personal crisis that many of us were already facing, well before this global pandemic ever took shape. When crisis hit, believers, being a believer means we run to the throne of grace in prayer, not as a secondary caveat 
to our lives, but as a priority because we realize where our help come from. David says in Psalm 121 verse 2, My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. It mean, I mean, we no longer lean to our own understanding, but where in all our ways we acknowledge him. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Because we know the only way this path is going to be made, made straight is if Jesus himself does it on our behalf. I don't want to be a disciple anymore. I, I don't want to be just a disciple. I want to be a believer. I want to live a surrendered life that is submitted to Jesus and is so much so dependent on him that he is the first place that I look in every season in my life, every day in my life, and through every crisis of my life. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. The disciples are just becoming believers and it happens at the end of a miracle. When someone has given the best they have to offer and their best isn't good enough. Don't miss this. The in inaugural sign that John writes down as the primary way we are going to begin to get pointed in the di direction of a real faith field, believing relationship with Jesus is a situation where someone has given the best they have to offer and their best ain't good enough. And it is into that situation of emptiness that Jesus, when he is invited, steps in and fills it up, not only to overflowing, but it makes it better than it was when they had their own resources and they were initially, that were, that, that were initially at their disposal. I love this. I love this passage of scripture because John basically communicates to us two things. The bad news is first. And the bad news is, number one, that your best will probably never be good enough. Your best will probably never be good enough. Do you feel like that ever? Do you feel like you are constantly in a situation where you keep giving the best you have, the best you have ain't good enough, like the best emotional investment that you have in that marriage, and it just doesn't seem to be good enough? The best emotional investment that you have in your kids, mom, mothers, and you keep giving your best, single mothers, you are doing everything that you can to train them to build character, character to build integrity, and it seems that there is no fruit for what it is you are pouring in the lives of your kid that you love so much. Maybe it's a financial investment that you are making, or maybe it's an investment of your creative ideas and your gifts and your talents, your patience. You have been investing the best you have to give, and it seems like your best isn't good enough. The bad news is we will constantly in life be in situations where our best 
is never good enough. Number two, this is the good news. The good news is, is last. Number two, Jesus' best is better than good enough. That's point number two. Jesus' best is better than good enough. That's the good news. Jesus gives us his best to supplement and even to overcome our own. And his best is anything that could ever produce on our own anyway. He keeps on giving himself. Jesus keeps on giving us himself. It's like the Apostle Paul says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. I boast in my weakness. I stop hiding the fact that my best and good enough. I go ahead and celebrate the fact that my best isn't good enough because I recognize now that every time my best is not suited to the need that is at hand in front of me, every time that shows up in my life, whether it is a business endeavor, a ministry endeavor, a family relationship, every time I am in that situation where I am totally uncomfortable because my wine doesn't run out, because I have Jesus. Mothers, what we need to do is invite Jesus to our parties. Invite him to our party and let him know that you are totally willing to do whatever he requires of you so we can turn this little water we've got left in our tank into wine that would blow people's minds, that would show them that his best is astounding. And do you know what happened when Jesus showed up at parties, at parties like this? Do you know what happened when Jesus showed up at weddings and circumstances in our life when we have given our best and our best is not good enough? What happens is that he makes a believer out of the people around you. He makes a believer out of them, not just a disciple. He makes them believers. I got to tell you, I'm counting on you, mothers. I'm counting on everyone to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And a good, a perfect example of someone that believed is found in 2 Kings chapter 4. Elisha said to the woman to use what you have. 2 Kings chapter 4 starts off with a widow who approached Elisha. She said that her husband, his servant, has died. And he left her with a jar of olive oil. She knows that his creditors will come and take her sons as slaves. So she went to Elisha for help. Elisha's instruction to the widow is to use what you have. Elisha told the widow to go around to her neighbors and collect jars. She should fill the jars with olive oil and then sell those same jars. So she did as Elijah instructed and was able to pay off her husband's debt. Her and her sons lived on the remainder. So they had enough money. So mothers, when you look at what your kids are traversing right now, the pressure that is around them normally, the consuming of information that is at their endless disposal, in their hands, through their iPads, cell phone, on the te their television screens. The things that would never be allowed are now coming in the movies and the television and everything that they are watching. It is 
inundating them as you sit there realizing that the best you have to give them and trying to instill character, trying to instill integrity and praying towards them, hoping that their spiritual fervor is cultivated in their life that can only be at work of the Holy Spirit. So you keep on giving your best and it just feels like your best is never going to be good enough. But I hear John through this sign reminding us that our best would likely in the scenarios that matters most to us in our life. Our best will probably not be good enough. But every time that happens, we shouldn't be disappointed to the extension that we are discouraged. We shouldn't be disappointed so much that we can continue onward, continuing forward. Instead, every time we are outnumbered, every time we are outmatched, every time we are the underdog, every time we should actually sit forward with our chin in our hands and our eyes peeled because that means Jesus is on the way. And if we let him in, if we invite him to our parties, he will turn water into wine. I want to encourage all of you from every phase of life, every phase of your life and every season of your life, but particularly on this Mother's Day, if you are a mom and you feel like, if you are a mother and you feel like you are giving your best and through the stages of your children, Parenting will always seem like your best you have to offer will never be good enough. John says that's the primary sign. That's the main way that God introduces himself, not just to you, but to the people around you in your sphere of influence. And we want to, introduce, to be introduced to him, meaning we know about him, but we want to have a closer relationship with Jesus. So we know about him. We know about how God made the walls of Jericho basically implode on themselves. We know how he divided the Red Sea. We know how he divided the Jordan and told the people to turn around and put in stones of remembrance. We know about the details, not just in the Old Testament, but we know about the New Testament of how Lazarus was raised from the dead. I can tell you about what God has done. I know it in my head. But I don't just want to know it anymore. I want to see it for myself. I want to see God show up and take a little bit and make a lot. I want to see him take five loaves and two fish and so multiply in such a way an astounding way that I know that he has shown up and shown me himself experientially his miraculous working power. John says, this is a sign that you are headed in the right direction. In John chapter two, John, Jesus, the mother of Jesus is a powerful woman. She set a good example for us. And we should be doing the same thing for our kids. And you got to understand this. When you are in a situation where your best is not good enough, it points out to you who Jesus is and it makes a believer out of you. It's not going to be because we are perfect, because none of us are. It's not going to be because we had all our stuff together. In hindsight, when you look back and see that, Mom, you are doing the best that you can do with what you know right now. And so what that means is that we are counting on our transparencies. And I want to show you in John chapter 2, 
It is possible to give your best and your best not be good enough. But that's when Jesus steps in and he actually turns into something beautiful and staggering. I'm praying for us, mom, just like these disciples in verse number 11 of chapter 2. Just like he made believers out of them, and I'm telling you, he will make believers out of yours. Your sons, your daughters, your nieces and nephews, your grandsons, your granddaughters, they are going to become believers in Jesus. They might be disciples, but they won't be believers unless they see a woman who is dependent herself upon the Lord. A woman who herself knows she makes mistakes and is having to, to learn to live in the rhythms of the grace and the mercy of the goodness of God. It's not because we are perfect that we are going to make believers out of them. Disciples, maybe, but because we can teach them how to know the book to quote scriptures, memorize scriptures, and go to church because they're supposed to. But believers, that's a different thing. They're going to have to see someone who saw Jesus intervene in their life. And you want to be that kind of woman. But I want to encourage you, particularly moms, but all of us to get yourself out of Facebook and get your face in the book and just know according to John's that's the primary sign that's going to point you and the people you love in relationship with Jesus. Finally, I want to point out to you just a couple of little clues, a couple of things that John left hidden within these 11 verses. In fact, they are all tucked within the first verse. And he tucked them in here, I believe, as little intentional clues for us to make sure we understood that he did not do this as a mishap. It wasn't a mistake. It was clearly intentional because he wanted to point us to Jesus. Our worship should only be devoted to our God. And we ought to be reminded that he and he alone that works miracles like this. Verse 1, he says, did you notice the clues in verse 1? He says, 1, this happened the third day. That's clue number 1. He says, it happened at a wedding. That's clue number two. Then he says, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. Now, notice, Mary is only found here and in one other place in his gospel. And that's at the cross and at the crucifixion. John wanted to build a sturdy bridge between the insufficiency of a human and in chapter 2, the sufficiency of Christ at the crucifixion. He wanted to basically communicate to us, to you, that all your insufficiencies and mine have been covered by the redemption that came to us at the cross. And then he says, on the third day, that's when this wedding took place, he didn't just want to point to a crucifixion. And he wanted to point to the third day when there was a resurrection. He wants, he wants to tell us today that the same power that conquered the grave is the exact same power that is alive and at work on the inside of you to sustain every single day of your life. And he says finally, the third clue, this was not just any regular party. This was a wedding. You know, there is another wedding coming to us. 
right where you are. Probably sooner than you think because one day the sky is going to split and the bridegroom is going to appear and he's coming for his bride and there's a wedding that will take place, a union and a marriage that we have been waiting on as the bride of Christ. And in that day, he will rescue us from our weaknesses, taking us with him once and for all to the heavenly places. And we will have glorified bodies, never to experience those insufficiencies again. Until then, John says, be encouraged to know that he's got you from the cross. It will sustain you through your life. It will take you to heaven. Eternity is real. Heaven is real. Our God is on his way. And brothers and sisters, be encouraged on Mother's Day, on this Sunday, and know that your God has got your back. Number one, you are blessed and surrounded by God's favor. Psalm chapter 5, verse 12. Number two, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm chapter 139, verse 14. Number three, you have been called out of darkness and into God's wonderful light to praise him. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Be strong and be encouraged. May God bless you. May heaven smiles upon you. That's my prayer. I want to invite you. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says that as many received them, to death gave the, gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Family, I want to ex extend this personal invitation for you to join with the family of God. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to come. Come and give your life to him. Just come and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Is there one this morning? Is there one? Unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and ever that the people of God say amen. Happy, happy Mother's Day. Still as 